So I hope the people down the back can hear me because uh, I, I don't like microphones and I don't like inflicting long speeches on audiences. I learned that in, in my humble 14 year career in, in the political life of Leinster House in this country that people don't like long speeches. Uh, they like and uh, love brevity, particularly when it's a summer evening in Dublin. I'd like to thank Frank for his generous, uh, far too generous uh, recommendation of my book. Uh, I'm apologising to all of you, this is not a commercial. It is out of print. Oh, sadly, the publisher, Mr John O'Connor of Blackwater Press, died uh, between its publication uh, and today. And it's sold out. I don't even have copies of the book myself. So I can't do, as somebody asked me to do earlier on, offer one for everyone in the audience, uh, as uh, one very famous broadcast in this country used to do every Saturday night. I can't offer you any copy other than to urge that you go on Amazon, and there are some copies there, I understand, and I, from time to time, do have to go on that myself in order to give it to friends uh, and the rest. Uh, therein lies the tale of why I was even asked uh, to write a book like this. But again, uh, like Frank, I paid a visit to Kinsili before Mr. O'Hee died, uh, and it was a very interesting encounter uh, because I actually also, like Frank, was seeking an interview uh, for a publication then called The Nation, which was the Fianna Fáil publication of which I was the somewhat, I wouldn't say too much, august or uh, editor. Uh, and of course, I arrived in Kinsili with this specific request in mind that would Mr. O'Hee deign to do an interview with the party's official uh, magazine. Uh, it was kind of an interesting encounter because he was at that stage in, I think, what his daughter described in the Mint Productions series, uh, he was under virtual house arrest, and that's according to his daughter, uh, because he was not allowed to do any more media or interviews of any kind. So I think Frank did very, very well in even getting an interview three weeks before his death because, in fact, at that stage, uh, I was pressing rather hard that he should get his, his, his line out because, that, in fact, if he weren't uh, careful about his legacy, it might be entirely dominated by uh, the events and the revelations about the money and the corruption uh, that we read and we all know about uh, in the public tribunal. Uh, and after a short while, he, in his usual manner, Mr. Hyde picked up a letter that happened to be on his study desk and he said, I'd love to do the interview, Connor, but read that. It was a letter from Mr. Ivor Fitzpatrick, who was, was his solicitor and has an office just around the corner from here. Uh, and it was to the effect that Mr. Hyde was not to entertain at all, at all, at all, in, in the Irish expression that, that we all know and love, to entertain even the idea of having any more interviews. Because he did, shortly before I called to Concili, do an interview, um, which was a, a RTE program focused on the art scene in Ireland in the 1960s. He did do an appearance, and I, I'd imagine, given all the different interviews he did over the years, it probably wasn't a very taxing interview uh, that he did for this documentary. But on foot of doing that interview, uh, I think Mr. Fitzpatrick was written to by the uh, counsel for the tribunal, who states that we see your client is physically or health-wise claiming that he's not well enough to appear before the tribunal, yet he's appearing on television uh, in, in documentaries. And so he said, I think I better not do any more. He said, I think you'll understand that. And I said, I did. And we then moved to the larger point uh, about his legacy. And I said that uh, it would be dominated by the tribunal and there was no way around that uh, for obvious reasons. And I said that maybe he should consider commissioning or asking or inviting uh, an individual author, writer, journalist, whoever, uh, to write a biography of him uh, that would, if you like, leaven that message and simply point out uh, some of the other facts, other than those that are so well known now at this stage, uh, they certainly don't bear repetition uh, that appeared in the tribunal. He, he took the, the idea on board and he talked about one journalist, in particular Mr. Vincent Brown, who I think had been hanging around Concilium, hoping to be that man and to be that biographer. And I'm not entirely convinced that uh, Mr. Hoy thought that was a good idea, and uh, that Vincent Brown should be his biographer, official, unofficial, or otherwise. But uh, at the end of the day, actually, Vincent Brown, who, despite some of the contretemps I've had with him over the years on television, is a very good friend of mine. And he is actually, and has retired from 
the world of television and journalism, to commit himself to writing a very extensive biography of Mr. Hyde, which I think is something we should all uh, wait for. It won't be the final word on Mr. Hyde by any yardstick, because there's still an awful lot, I, I would suggest, of archives from the official archives to emerge. And there's also the Hawhey family archive, which is uh, being compiled and about to be released. There's also an official biographer, uh, I suppose, working with the family, Gary from uh, Dublin City University. And, and he has access to archives that were actually kept uh, in, in Concilio over the years. So there is an our substantial documentary uh, material that is yet to emerge and will make, uh, I suppose, future scholars of Mr. Hoy uh, very interested in the topic itself. I came to this by a rather strange route, having offered on that occasion, meeting Mr. Kinsey, uh, Mr. Hoy and Kinsey, uh, the prospect that I might even do it myself if he couldn't find uh, somebody to write the biography. We did, in fact, conclude, uh, just to bring that to, a, to, a, to, a, to a, this end, we did say, uh, uh, discuss at the time, that maybe some documentary uh, made on television, which would feature some of, of his friends that he would nominate uh, for the interview purposes. Uh, that is, in effect, the Mint Productions series which you saw on RT. It, they didn't give or take any hostage to fortune in terms of only interviewing people whom he approved. But you would note, if you get a chance to watch that series, that there are people quoted and interviewed on that who in a million years wouldn't entertain the notion of giving an interview about Mr. Hoy, but for the fact that he, he gave a certain amount of approval for them to do so. So that is a very good source when looking at Mr. Hoy. I think there are also very interesting books written by T. Ryle Dwyer and, of course, Bruce Arnold. And they, they framed the issue for me in, in terms of writing my own book. And the reason I was asked to write it was very interesting because RT did another series which was fictional uh, in the early part of 2015. And I was in my mother's kitchen and uh, John O'Connor came around to the house to meet me. Uh, I, I was back from Russia or something. And he, he said, would you do a, a biography of And I said, I'd be delighted to do it because you know, time and distance. I, I wouldn't have felt as comfortable years before that doing one because of the closeness of the whole thing. But I'd sort of come to the conclusion when they were fictionalizing uh, on Mr. Hoy's uh, somewhat fictional, <laughs> fictionalized life already, uh, that certainly the amount of time had it flux to make it possible for me to write a book and possible for me to be slightly more objective than I would have been uh, had that not happened. So I, I took up the uh, publisher's challenge and decided to write the book. I wrote it in about three months, which some people kind of gasp with horror or gasp with delight, depending on what side of the, the literature side of the house you come from. But it needs, needs most. Uh, there was a deadline. The publisher had a deadline. He wanted to do well with this book, precisely because I think several hundred thousand people watched this RT series. And so I started to write the book. And I started the research. I spent about a month and a half basically researching all the existing sources that were extant and published, including uh, the Bruce Arnold book, the T. Ryle Dwyer book, and some earlier books about the 1960s and about La Masse. And I decided, having done a certain amount of research, that I would divide the book in three, in a way. Uh, the extant sources, uh, uh, in effect, a chronological biography of Mr. Hyde. And so it's divided in three, really. The, the extant sources. Uh, the observations that I knew and, and could make from actually experiencing and meeting the man and having uh, large and very substantial discussions with him over the years, and then what my father had told me. So they're, they're the three parts. So it's, it's a three-component uh, three biography, uh, mining existing sources, mining my own memories, and of course what my father told me growing up in, in, in a political household. So that was the, the, the motivation really, I suppose, was to get the book out first and foremost, and secondly, I suppose, to try to broaden uh, the understanding of the public, but particularly given the profile of people who watched the RT programme, I was more than conscious, given my own age, I was born in 1963, and at that stage, coming up to write my first book, I was very conscious of the fact that people of my age and over are well familiar with Mr. Hyde. They're well familiar with all of the different backstabbing and behind stairs goings on, shenanigans, whatever you want to, that lots and lots of people of my age and over are very well aware of the personalities. If, if you mention the name George Colley or Desmond O'Malley or Brian Lenehan or uh, uh, Bobby Malloy, that 
this generation of my own age group lovers would know and be familiar with them, but I'm very conscious that the people who are watching the program were in here when the publisher was hoping to sell the books to, uh, as a factual as opposed to a fictional life story of Mr. Hyde, would not know these people at all. So that was very helpful when I was writing the book, because I was able to eliminate an awful lot of what I would call the drama and period piece dramas that happen in the quotidian life of a politician or a notorious person. That it, we often get trapped. And one of the most remarkable things was that I reread the book called The Boss uh, by Peter Murtagh, which was a fabulous book if you, wrote, if you read it at the time. It gave you an insight that wasn't being offered through the mainstream media. But actually, what horrified me was I thought this was going to be a great source, and I, I would literally churn out lots of quote unquote quote, anecdotes, vignettes, or whatever from that particular extant source. And it emerged that it was a very dated book because it captured a period. 81, 82, where there was an awful lot of crisis, there was an awful lot of what I would call backbench heaves going on against the guy. So, you know, I decided this wasn't really of any use to me at all because I was trying to address a much younger audience who wouldn't be familiar with the, the, the smaller manoeuvres, although they appeared very large and magnified at the time. So I, I wrote the book consciously in mind, a sort of 20 something year old would be reading this and picking this up and trying to determine what it is that their parents were always talking about her, what it was about this polarising figure that had everybody talking so vociferously about him. So that's the, the attitude and way I approached the book. I tried to be kind to Mr. High in one respect doing it because Maureen High at that stage of the publication book was still alive and I didn't, I didn't plumb to a certain extent the sexual side of Mr. High's life to any great degree. I referred to it uh, and if I were to rewrite the book or produce a second edition, I would go into that uh, uh, more so. The only point I make is that despite all the notoriety in these matters, he wasn't exactly, I would have thought, one of the greatest philanderers on earth because you know, to have one mistress over a, a long period from the 1970s right through to nearly to the point where he died is not an example of a philanderer. It may be a French habit of something of maintaining two households or something. I don't know. I, I don't wish to speculate here on that, but it's, it's, it's not a Don Juan uh, record he has in that area. So maybe if you're a critic of Mr. High, maybe he disappoints in that area too. Uh, but um, I suppose uh, to kind of frame the career of Charles High for everybody, I think it's important to remember there's, there's several ways you can slice this story. Uh, one very immediate way is to talk about before the arms trial and after the arms trial. And when I went to write the book, I decided that the arms trial would be the middle part of the book, or would be the chapter that would pivot you from what I would call the early days uh, to the isolation years and to, the, and to his ascent then to full power as Taoiseach. Uh, in fact, there's three ways. The, 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 three, the proper chronology to divide it is the early years up to the 60s, then the, the chicken and chip circuit years when he went around trying to rebuild after the, the scandal of the arms trial, and then the years in power. And what strikes you most forcibly when you sit down to write, dissect, analyse Mr. High is the short number of years he was actually fully in power. And in fact, it's arguable whether in fact he was ever in power, uh, because uh, not only did he not win the majority, which at that point in time when he became leader in 1979, many Fianna Fáil people, including myself and all sorts of dreamy-eyed Fianna Fáil enthusiastic actors, they all felt it was their divine right to have an overall majority. Mr. Hoy found in his career that he could never get one, and this was a significant source of criticism of him internally within the party, that he wasn't popular enough. Uh, we know why, <laughs> and we shouldn't be surprised. But the, the interesting thing is that he was not in power for very long, but he did cast a very long shadow and had a very long career in politics. Uh, but the power part of that was at a high point in the 1960s and then came to a second high point after 1987 when he finally started doing what he refused to do in his earlier rather checkered period in power from 79 uh, to 82 when he had all those elections, he had those internal heaves. Uh, and one could argue in his defence that he, it was very hard for him in the circumstances, both within his party and within the country generally, to fulfil any of his promises. That said, I think it's one of the most profound criticism of him as a leader uh, in Ireland uh, that he failed to honour the promise that he made on the television in 1980 when he said, we're all living beyond our means, it's time to tighten our belts. You know, obviously, uh, lots and lots of people made fun of that subsequent to the event, 
uh, because he didn't do that. In fact, in his lifestyle, he certainly didn't do it. But in a general sense, in terms of the National Exchequer, he went on a kind of veritable spending spree uh, and didn't, if you like, adopt austerity, for instance, in this, the way we had to uh, <coughs> in the run into 2011, in 2008 to 2011. He didn't honor uh, any of his promises in that regard. And in that sense, he became a profound disappointment to the very message and image and reputation he assiduously built up or propagandized about, about himself. In fact, some of the, the dominant narrative of his arrival to power within Fianna Fáil, I emphasise, uh, with the displacement of Jack Lynch in 1970, was that he was a businessman, he was a successful, wealthy person who could show great leadership in the economic and business area. And that was the expectation. That's why even people who didn't personally like him or disdained him and his lifestyle, and of course some of his planning and money-making efforts that were rumoured about but not put out front in the public sphere, many of the people suspended their poor judgment of him on the basis that he was going to be an actor on the national stage that was going to bring reality and enterprise values uh, to the economic management function, and that he was going to be a, a modern, if you like, rather more in-your-face version uh, of Sean Lamas. Uh, that didn't happen, and I think that was a, a supreme, if you like, jewel to him, and I suspect it's one of the main reasons why he never did get into a position, although he did come quite close uh, to winning a majority. But the other interesting point about was he in power for very long, he, he only really got a four-year period from 87 to his retirement in 1991. And even that four-year period was corrected very quickly by his own hubris in 1990 uh, when he called uh, an inopportune election and was forced then into coalition with his old nemesis, Mr. O'Malley. So, you know, uh, the idea that he was in power for very long is a bit of a myth, and I think that's important to start and otherwise to make out. The fact that he was in, in office and around the national political scene for so long from the 60s onwards is a very significant phenomenon. As I say, the early period in his credit is an, if, if one looked at Mr. Hyde up to the arms trial, one would conclude that this was a very progressive man. He, he passed very progressive legislation. I'm very conscious of this when we look around at the exhibition here this evening. That you know, the Succession Act was not some populist run by a a, populi a, a politician on the make. This measure was hugely opposed. Some of you in the audience may be aware of this. I obviously be more than that. I'm not fully aware of it, only through research and writing this book. But no lesser an organ in the Irish Times, which is always assumed to be uh, the repository of liberal good sense and common sense in this country when it comes to matters of politics and others, it opposed viciously uh, this particular measure. So, you know, there was huge resistance in Ireland to this uh, measure of in the Succession Act. In other words, allowing women who were married to have proper inheritance rights. Uh, this was not, by any yardstick, a welcome measure. So it's not the output or the, the fashion of politicians, as you know, uh, to entertain something that might be un unpopular. Mm -hmm. And certainly now it is even more so. Uh, it's most unlikely to happen. <coughs> if there is clear and uh, obvious opposition from the Irish Times, uh, because that nowadays, uh, in my experience, sir, of f limited experience of 14 years in public life, that if the Irish Times are against it, uh, there's a kind of default liberalism, small L liberalism in the political system, which means they, they all want to oppose it, and if they're for it, they really want to support it. So I don't want to dwell on that because it might be a little bit unfair to the Irish Times. But the Succession Act is generally groundbreaking. And if you look at his, his career, even Gore Vidal acknowledged this in an interview with Dorothy that. This was a very progressive person up to the 1960s, up to the Armstrong. You had this progressive legislation of the arts, you had progressive legislation with regard to the elderly, the free travel. Uh, you had you know, a career which was extraordinary. This was a kind of plutocrat, comes to Ireland and uh, has this almost, as I put it in the book, Disney-like uh, career trajectory. He marries well, he marries the, uh, the daughter of one of the greatest states of an that Ireland produced. Uh, post independence. So, you know, he marries well, he does well financially, he has his races and his horses in training, he's winning an art race there too, and he has the large Gandhi mansion. So, life couldn't have been going better for Mr. I up to the arms trial. Uh, and then the arms trial happens where he's caught up in, in a very significant covert operation of state. 
And, and, and this was one of the things in the book I, I really wanted to bring attention to. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't get much attention to the media when they actually covered the book. I thought this would get lots of attention, what I said in that particular part of the book. But it just shows you again that we're all very much dated by our own time and our own memories. And, and the significance that we sometimes attribute to things is often defined by our age and our own memories of what's important or not important. The fact of the matter has got virtually no coverage. But I state definitively, I think for the first time, that this was a legitimate covert operation state. The uh, effort to raise, arm, supply both the IRA and citizens' defence committees, as they were politely termed in North Ireland, was an authorised political operation mounted by the then government, of which my father was a member, and he never made any secret to us at home what that was about, that everybody knew about it. But yet, for 20, 30 years in Ireland, it would almost put you off the country. We were in denial about this. And a lot of people, because of the influence, I suspect, of Jack Lynch and those uh, around him, were able to suppress that and say it was a rogue element within the government that were privately and off their own initiative arming the IRA or giving weapons uh, to people north of the border. And, and that's a very interesting fact. And it tells you an awful lot about where Mr. Hoy was at that time and where the country was at that time. And I think it's important that that's pointed out because sometimes uh, during the peace process we hear unions complaining that it was Mr. Hoy and the southern government that created the IRA. Well, in fact, there's a certain amount, I don't want to give or accord total uh, verbatim truth to that assertion by the youth, but yes, the Southern State did arm and train, uh, including uh, the late Martin McGuinness, in thinner camp where these people were uh, recruited and made temporary members of the Defence Force, the FCA, in fact, uh, so that they could then take the training and so that ministers could then say to go, no person who is not an initiated member of the Defence Force receives training from the Irish government in weapons and destruction. And the interesting thing is, in my later life, the journalist covering the peace process, I did the first interview with Mr. Adams when they lifted that Section 31 ban, thanks to Michael D. Higgins, who was Minister of Culture at the time. When I met IRA people, and I was intermediary with Mr. Reynolds at a later stage in the, in the process, some of them were extremely proud of the training they received in Fitter Camp or Fort Tunney. They said, one of them in particular, a very senior member of the IRA command structure before the ceasefire, said to me, I got training in, in Libya, I got training in Zimbabwe, I got training in, in, in Russia, and none of it compared to the committed young officers of the Irish Defence Forces who trained us in, in Trunry. They, tra they trained them in all sorts of mayhem, and that was the great surprise for some of those uh, gentlemen in the IRA in the 1960s, probably 70s. They thought they were going to be trooped around, paraded, loading, unloading weapons. They were treated to a very spectacular form of training in urban warfare, how to take out <coughs> supply plants, how to do economic back damage, and all of that sort of thing. So it, it is an interesting fact, and it's all right, that one of the consequences of the arms trial is that, that the IRA subsequent, not immediately, from 1969 onwards, became a very effective um, operation in terrorist terms because they got this training at the early stage. Some of the senior people, they, they knew then how to, how to conduct themselves, let's say, in, in that particular area. The other thing, I suppose, about the arms that's important to point out, and I, you know, apart from it, the long shadow it left within Fianna Fáil and the nervousness uh, within government circles mm -hmm. actually dealing with the north of Ireland as an issue are robustly squaring up uh, to the British with regard to their responsibilities to be impartial in terms of the conflict. And that's the great breakthrough of the peace process, this famous statement that Brooke made where he said British had no self-interest, did reason for remaining in Northern Ireland, which was the signal in 1992 that caused the peace process to really happen, is that the British professed, uh, and, and I, I certainly believed them at the time and still do, that they had no real strategic or selfish interest in remaining on in the six counties or Northern Ireland, depending how you wish to refer to it. I think that was very, very interesting that that statement was made. But the interesting, more interesting feature is that the Seamus Mallon line and other people who said lots of what was available in the Good Friday Agreement, I think it was Mallon used the phrase, uh, Sunningdale for slow learners. It is a fact that in every single decade since the trouble started, not around from 66, the British government were in touch with the IRA through surreptitious or quite overt channels where Mr. McGuinness and Mr. Adams were actually 
brought to Chips Channon's home in Cheney Walk, which I had the good fortune to be entertained in at one stage. And I, I asked Mr. Channon, is that where Mr. Adam sat? And he kind of chuckled and said, yes, those were the days, those were the days. So there was an expectation at all stages that the British wanted to leave and facilitate their, their own exit. And one of the, the great sort of missed opportunities here was that, that because of the arms trial, the southern state was in effect hobbled from actually dealing robustly with the British government. And it took until, in fairness, the Gareth Fitzgerald signed uh, the Anglo-Irish Agreement, you know, which featured more cooperation. It took quite a long time. And Mr. Hoy, to his credit, started with his famous talks in, 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 in Dublin Castle, Mrs. Thatcher, to start an actual civilised relationship and an appreciation and understanding by uh, the British civil service, particularly Sir Robert Armstrong was one of the key drivers of that, over and above uh, Mrs. Thatcher's resistance, which she professed in her, in her own autobiography that she didn't want to go down this road, uh, being a good genius that she was. But the fact of the matter is the British civil service, the mandarins, the, the establishment, the people who make things happen in, in, in British public life, insisted that she go down that road because it was necessary both at a security and strategic level to start that. Uh, and so one of the great tragedies of this high career and the arms trial is that the sun, and there is, by the way, evidence, very strong evidence, that the arms importation was discovered at a very early stage by British intelligence, and that they had almost a vested interest in making sure not only that the arms trial, the arms importation didn't happen, but that it was publicised in a way that would split the country down the middle. And in effect, that's what actually happened. I'm not saying that Fianna Fáil, Fianna Fáil was also split quite significantly by that arms trial, uh, but the country was quite divided about it as well. And, and that did inhibit Irish governments from raising the issue in, in the years that followed from that. The other thing, of course, was the fact that we were in a Cold War uh, and the Americans weren't prepared, notwithstanding Irish efforts to raise money and raise the issue in the United States. When there was a Cold War on, the, the Americans were most unlikely to commit on the side of what might be perceived to be left-wing Marxist revolutionary terrorists against a settled ally like Britain. So it's only really when the, the Cold War ends that you see these conflicts in South Africa and Ireland and other conflicts uh, disappearing. Back to Mr. Hoy, I suppose the arms trial is very ironic in some ways because actually it's both the undoing of his early career but the making of his later career. And what's really interesting about the arms trial is that pretty much everybody who was uh, germane to and part of uh, the, we'll call it the conspiracy uh, to import arms, uh, all of them left Fianna Fáil. So the, some of the great figures, figures actually who would have been serious power rivals to Mr. I within Fianna Fáil, left the party, uh, namely Kevin Boland, Neil Blaney being the most spectacular, Paul Brennan, lots of very strong, forceful people on what we might call the Republican side of Fianna Fáil, because the party is a broad church and always has been, and that explains some of its success since its foundation, because it can kind of accommodate people of both left and right instincts, and then people who just like to play it down the middle. So this explains Mr. Hoy's rise more than anything else. When the other people quit the party, Hoy was left as the last of the line of the Republican element in the party. So he had a, a ready-made grouping within the party structure and the membership and in the parliamentary party and indeed in the cabinet who were surreptitiously or otherwise ready and willing to support him. Of course he was in the post-arms trial fiasco, we call it, as he described it in the press conference after the trial uh, quitted him. Uh, it was a fiasco, the trial itself, and it shouldn't have happened in, in real terms, but uh, political motives were at play there. But he had a, a ready audience, and he then started canvassing those people, placing his own people in the organisation, placing his own TDs for election, most spectacularly in 1977. Something I didn't quote in the book, which I'm glad Frank referred to Geraldine Kennedy. She met Mr. Hoyer on the night of the count in 1977 when Jack Lynch attained this marvellous, marvellous landslide. And Mr. Hoyer was, I suppose, tackled by Geraldine, I, I, I suspect, and so what do you think of that? Like your, your great, your great uh, nemesis, Mr. Lynch, is doing very well here this evening. To which he said, oh, that's fine, he said, but all the TDs, they're all mine, he said. <laughs> in other words, he had worked so assiduously from the upset back in, in, in 1970 
because he'd done this famous rubber chicken or chicken and chip circuit. And, and no audience or no meeting was too, too low for Mr. Hoy not to attend. He arrived in the great big Jaguar car. He made his speeches, but he, did, he put his head down and started working, seeing very little, but building up relentlessly. And I suppose one of the critiques I would have of that whole period, that it's most unusual in political life, particularly in, in my own 14 year career, for you to get the opportunity, and I say this as an advisory to Frank and the James Lawless TD, who's here, uh, a member for Kildare, that it's very rare in public life in Ireland that you get the chance to reflect and think about your actual position, your philosophy, your personal philosophy, or your political philosophy. And this is one of the great weaknesses of the Irish political system, because it's not big on intellectuals, and it's not big on people who carry ideological or philosophical baggage with them. I think sometimes people say we're culturally middle brown as a country. I think politically we're sort of middle brown too. We don't entirely uh, roll out the full Jamaat for people who are public in the office. Of course, Michael D. Higgins is a great and renowned exception. Uh, and even he faced an awful lot of hassle in his life because of this. He was ridiculed to a large extent, to the extent that Mary Robinson was actually preferred as a candidate. I perceived no hope an outsider was selected as a candidate with the view to stopping Michael D. becoming <laughs> president or selected by his own party. And that's the fact that some people forget today in the great enthusiasm for him uh, in his current role as president that he had some very dark years like Mr. Hoy, where he was isolated, mm -hmm. and particularly isolated with regard to the leadership of his own party, who regarded him as a menace, uh, and on no account to be allowed to run for the, the Phoenix Park as the candidate to be president. So just an interesting sidelight on how politicians, but the one thing I would say to Frank, and of course to James Lawless, is that at your peril, do not build in philosophy and thinking to your actual political presentation. I think this is one of the big problems in Ireland, and I, I don't want to personalise to the current issue or a number of other ones that I've worked with are, are faced up against, but I would say that it's a massive, massive problem in Ireland that we're not putting people with a very strong, even personal philosophy, I'm not being dictatorial or didactic here, saying you must have a philosophy, but it's become a value-free zone, politics in Ireland today, a value-free zone where people don't really have values, and I say this cross and that's part of the reason why the big parties have declined so from a period of the 80s, 90s onwards, the big parties have decayed and declined, losing and ceding support, because they're not presenting a very strong philosophical view, not even a very strong cultural view. And in fairness to Mr. Owen, he's one of the last Taoiseach who had a cultural vision with respect to the culture. He tried uh, to work the Ilston and the art scheme. He did have an interest in New Grange, he did have an interest in writing, Talent. And that's mirrored in some of the advisors that he had. He had Anthony Crowland, he had uh, Mr. Cabot on environmental issues, PJ Mar on communications. He had a huge welter, Sam Stevenson was even an advisor. The whole welter of people advising him who were very, uh, I suppose, significant practitioners in the fields they came from. And that's a very interesting thing that you don't see today. And, you know, I had 14 years in the Dole, seven years as a minister. And you know, the, the caliber of advisors has even declined since Mr. Hardy's time, and indeed Mr. Fitzgerald's time. I think one of the extraordinary reasons why Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael's dominance of the political system survived was this great punch and duty show between Hawley and Fitzgerald. Uh, one of my criticisms in the book of Hawley is that, actually in fairness to Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald came with a vision which he then didn't execute, which was the pluralist style, which we're now seeing, ironically, I, I would suggest as a result of uh, the most recent referendum and the one before that on gay marriage, that we're now living definitively in a post-Catholic secular republic. And that's a very good thing. I know some people would say the issue about education is not resolved still, and the state involvement there. And there are other amendments with regard to the, the women, the role of women in the home. These will and definitely be changed. Uh, the point I would say that we're now definitively in a post-Catholic world. I think it was a great tragedy that Gareth Stroud didn't follow through on his ambition in that area. I think it particularly opportunistic of Mr. Hoy to pick the abortion issue as the issue he would differentiate himself from uh, Dr. Fitzgerald. I think it was the wrong issue, and I, I had a personal friendship with Peter Sutherland, and 
I always remember at the time, Peter Sutton was one of the few people to point out that, which I thought was ironic, and of course no, nobody was in the, what we would call pro-life tendency, who were willing to hear this, they thought he was Satan when he pointed it out. Peter Sutton pointed out that, in fact, the pro-life amendment being proposed, proposed by the pro-life movement, uh, adopted by Mr. High without question, uh, was precisely worded in such a way he felt as a lawyer and a former attorney general uh, that would actually facilitate abortion in the long run because it could be interpreted either way. So, I, you know, there's a deep irony in that, uh, that we hire people in Ireland like Mr. Sutherland to give legal advice, but we blissfully ignore them when it becomes inconvenient for our politics or for uh, our personal realm or whatever you want to describe it. So I think it's ironic, as you stand here today, that all of that could have been avoided. There was, in my view, no need for a constitutional assertion of that right. It is properly an issue that you should trust politicians about, actually. And I think the whole pro-life movement was manipulated by Hoy in order to differentiate himself from Fitzgerald without actually having to go to the bother of presenting a definite alternative vision to what Fitzgerald was putting up by way of the Second Republic, which was a great tragedy indeed, because if Mr. Hoy had chosen to position himself in a real sense as a, an avatar or a promoter or protector or defender of traditional values, he might actually have done an awful lot better than he did. And he may actually, oddly enough, have got a majority or stayed longer in the political system. Of course, many people know this would not have liked that to have happened, so I'm not suggesting I support that too. <laughs> but the next thing I suppose I want to deal with really is the whole, this kind of ambiguity about Hoy. Hoy was a marginaliser clearly up to the 1960s, progressive. Uh, when he got into power, his record became patchy, and then he had this period in 1987 onwards, where he did really, and can lay credit uh, to having created the upgrade in Ireland's economic fortunes, implementing austerity, coming about up with pro pro uh, championing the cause of the IFSC, which allowed us to transition to a more successful economy a lower employment uh, and employment economy. Uh, that was a huge thing. Temple Bar was a very big achievement on his part. I, and I think the other things are the restoration of Royal Hospital Carl Maynham, the restoration of Dublin Castle, the Garden of Friends had an influence in that as well. Uh, there's a lot of big projects that Hoy sponsored, and he was at one level, and this is, I suppose, a, a, another lesson for today, is that it's very important, no matter who you're next in the next election, that you put people into the door who have executive <laughs> competence and capability. One of the dispiriting things I saw as someone who worked in business before I went into the political system is the, the deficit or dearth of people with executive skills. I'm not talking about entrepreneurial skills, because you read that in the business pages all the time. We should have more businessmen in there, businesswomen as well. You know, they'd be much better at this. They are, and we know businessmen aren't perfect. Look at Mr. Crump, you know, I think. Nobody would say he's perfect and he's a very, he was allegedly a very successful businessman. So the point I make is that we need people with executive skills, not necessarily entrepreneurial, serious executive skills of running things and being able to run things in the dawn. And if, if I do urge you to vote for anybody in the next life, it's vote for people, men and women, with those skill sets that they can actually go in and run things and organize them. Uh, the place. And one of the great tragedies since Mr. Hyde left is that that executive competence has not been as pronouncedly there as it was when he was there. And that was one of his big, big, big things. My father always said this. He said he was most unsuited to electoral and elective office. And we know why, because of the tribunals and other reasons, why he was unsuited. Because he miscalculated regularly and often on political considerations, calling the election in 1989 90, most of advised the wrong thing to do. And then, of course, he ended up with uh, have to share share the taxi with Mr. O'Malley and his old enemies. You know, there's countless numbers of political mistakes he made. Mulder always argued that he wasn't a natural politician. In fact, he was a method actor. Uh, he, had, he said he was a very good executive guy who could run things and was probably more suited to being a European commissioner than an accountable day-to-day -day quotidian uh, politician. Uh, but the message still shouldn't be lost that we do need people who have executive competence in, in the leadership roles to which we assign them through the door and then the government. I suppose we know the negatives uh, about Mr. I spoke about some of them. I don't want to talk too long, I probably have already. Uh, it's a complicated and difficult issue. And writing the book was quite an interesting exercise for me because you have to draw some moral judgments about people. And I think 
Patrick Maugham of the Royal Irish Academy wrote a monograph some years back where he talked about how he, and I quote this in the book, as being a technician of power. In other words, pointing out that he was a technician or technocrat rather than a person with a great, profound personal vision. And he tactically then accommodated to other political and other, uh, we call it, straws and wind or wherever the direction was going. That was a tragedy because he had the intellect to promote uh, his own vision but didn't do so. Uh, and I think that, in the end of the day, is the final epitaph about him, that while he was and did, as Mr. Cosgrave said about him, not by the way on his death, but at the time of his retirement, as Dish just gently corrected it, he said he achieved more than his critics. That is absolutely true and fair, in my view. And uh, Liam Cosgrave was a real thorough gentleman, a very fair minded person, despite what uh, we in Dinner Paul and other people thought about him over the years. He was a real gentleman, and, and I think that's a fair description of his life. Of course, what he did, and I think I, I quote this in, in the book, he was, in a sense, good for the country, but very bad for politics. He definitely damaged the civic and public fabric of our democracy to such an extent that it, I, I really don't believe the crowd in Stars, including me up to 2011, have really got over. Uh, and I think one of the biggest and profoundest regrets I have looking at my own career and what's happening now in Irish politics is that there's an absence of reform, just a very simple uh, phenomenon. I always thought and expected that people who are in leadership positions never should neglect the notion of reform, that you're not just asked to run a country or a company or an organisation and just run it on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, maximise, optimise profits or whatever uh, the metrics are, that you have an obligation to change and reform the organisation you're part of, to, to bring forward reforming items that change uh, demonstrably how the operation or organisation or country works. And I think this is one of the big problems that we now face in Ireland. We have a state sector, and I don't want to make, I'm not making a party political point here, but you look at the things that have most affected people in the last three years. They're around health, they're around housing, and what's happening with crime and race <coughs> crime here in Dublin. And the dominance of these drug networks, the fact that Ireland has somehow, I don't know how this happened, if any of you have an explanation, please tell me, how one of the biggest drug dealers in Europe is now a family that grew out of the north inner city in Dublin. And how all this mismanagement in the public sector has been allowed to continue is, to my mind, an issue of very serious consequence. We cannot expect to continue as a country and a people expecting the best services and the lowest taxes possible unless we not so much set a match to, but set our sights on what's happening in the public sector. The three areas of biggest concern to me would be the area of crime and policing, the area of health and the health that people and citizens can expect, and the area, obviously, of housing. Can we house people here, young people, people of ambition who want to move forward in this society? We're not doing any of those. We've created quangles, we've created structures, we talk about governance, but yet we seem to be willing, as a people and a political class as well, to outsource to agencies or quasi-governmental organisations that they used to the task of handling these three elemental things that affect the citizen. And I think, again, not to be telling you how you should vote, I think you should examine very closely the different parties that put themselves forward in this next section on those three issues. Because to my mind, they're issues of classic, classic mismanagement in the public sector realm. The reason the HSE, and I know, and I opposed it at the time, came into existence, was because the political people at the time wanted to shield themselves from the bad outcomes in the hospitals. They didn't want to be confronted in the dark about the A&E queues and the stories about elderly people, men and women, waiting in trials. They wanted to shield themselves. So they created something called the HSE. And now we see what the HSE does. And we know the results of that creation of the HSE, which happened during my period. And a lot of our backbenchers were belly red for opposing this publicly because our coalition part of the progressive terms now were all for this. She does. We're not responsible. Well, in fact, in my little simple word, the political class are responsible for the outcomes of the hospitals because it's taxpayers' money, and they are responsible for the crime in the streets, and they are responsible also uh, for the housing crisis. And it is their job to fix it. It's not some agency's job to fix it, and it's the job of ministers and teaching and members of the DAW to get into those organisations and fix it. 
And I'm amazed that, that when the HSE was created, how rare was the visit by the minister down to their headquarters there in Houston Station. If I were a minister of health, which of course I'd never allow me to be, but you'd be down there every day telling them what happened. Because, you know, if you get rid of ministerial responsibility for outcomes, well then don't complain when they start losing the records of people, women, who, 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 who with breast cancer. I mean, this is an absolute scandal of an enormous proportions. And what amazes me is that it's still not top of the news, that we all seem to get distracted by Brexit and all sorts of issues. There are, I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't talk about Brexit, <laughs> but what I will say is I'm really surprised that we spend so much time on that and not on those other three issues that I mentioned. I'm going to stop now because I, I, might, I might be getting into a rant here. So, <laughs> thank you for listening so patiently. Please come on with questions. Anybody knows me, I'm fairly thick skinned for about 14 years, so don't be afraid to be rude or challenging or point out inconvenient questions to me. I love hearing those. I'm almost it. Okay, thank you very much.